who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. Yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Oh, oh, oh. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross, then he rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by his grace. Let the house of the Lord see. the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. There's joy in this house. There's joy in this house today. We shout out your praise. Rescued me, tease it out, Jesus is alive. An empty cross, empty grave, life eternal, you have won the day. Shout it out, Jesus is alive. He's alive, and oh, happy day, happy day, you washed my sin away, oh. Happy day, happy day, I'll never be the same. Forever I am changed. When I stand in that place, free at last, meeting face to face, I am yours, Jesus, you are mine. Happy day, happy day, you wash my sin away, oh, happy day, happy day, I'll never be the same, forever I am changed, oh, what a 
glorious day, what a glorious way that you have saved me. And oh, what a glorious day, what a glorious name. Hey, and oh, happy day, happy day. Wash my sin away, oh, happy day, happy day, I'll never be the same, forever I am changed, forever I am changed. Well, I've never preached on this text before, I've looked back and Never preached on it. Wanted to, but I never have. Well, here we go. Great text. Um, as we go through this, really place yourself in whatever predicament you may be in, all right? Or maybe what you've been in. Um, we all go through junk in life, don't we? All of us do. This scene today in Luke 8 follows... Jesus and how he calmed the storm. Remember that story with his disciples. He's in a boat. There's a storm. The disciples wake up Jesus, and Jesus calms the storm. And then he says immediately to his disciples, hey, where's y'all's faith? Didn't use y'all, but where, I'm putting that in the Texas vernacular. Where's y'all's faith? I am convinced after studying this text aggressively this past week, and when pastors preach, if they're doing a correct job, and when they research, they're going to look at what's called the immediate context. You read the text that happens before and after to see what's going on. I am fully convinced that Jesus was preparing his disciples already in the boat, calling out their faith, preparing them for things to come. As if to say, guys, you think this was tough? Wait till you see what we're about to walk into. And then we immediately get into the next scene. Let's pick it up at Luke, the 8th chapter, verse 26. If you did bring your Bible with you today, this is a great chance for you to take notes. There's a lot of cool things in here. All right, here we go. They sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, or the, yes, Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. They are now going to be doing ministry in uncharted territory. It's an odd territory. The Gerasenes. That even sounds a little creepy, doesn't it? Uh, the Gerasenes. It sounds ominous because it is ominous. It's pagan property. And it's a dismal place where the demons roamed. Okay, as we walk through this, remember the place, Gerasenes. Place yourself. Maybe at times you've been in a dark place in your life. The Gerasenes. It's a dismal place where demons roamed. All right, let's go to verse 27. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in tombs. Now, you immediately see that this guy's in pretty rough shape. I guess we could say he's the Bible's first streaker, okay? He hung around with the skeletons, running around, unclothed with the skeletons. He didn't wear clothes and he lived in the tombs. And people had attempted to keep him under lock and key, but he repeatedly broke free. A crazy man. And as Jesus and his disciples haul up their boat on the shore, Jesus comes face to face with a deranged, demonic individual. A scary situation. When I'm preparing the message today, I had two movies in my mind I could not get out. 
One was The Exorcist, which I wouldn't advise anybody seeing. And the other was Amityville Horror. Maybe you've seen those movies. If you haven't, don't see them. Don't watch them. But that, those scenes kept coming to mind. And what came to mind is, okay, you think watching that movie is freaky? That's nothing compared to what we're walking in here. His name is Legion. And Luke explains this. Luke's great. In the narrative of Luke, Luke, not Nuke, the narrative of Luke is great. Luke, being a physician, always explains things. So Luke explains that this is because many demons had gone into him. A legion was the unit, a unit of the Roman soldiers numbering about 6,000 men. Can you imagine the damage that thousands of demons were inflicting on this poor man? But while Jesus is outnumbered, Jesus is not outmatched. Now I want you to pay close attention to the verbiage here, the verbiage. Because like all stories, all scenes, all texts in the Bible, at times you've got to pause It's what I call the power of the pause. You pause. And you really look at what's going on. You don't just roll through text of scripture as if you've got them memorized. But you pause. We're going to pause here. And we're going to pay special attention to what's happening. We're going to pay special attention that Jesus is in control of the battle. Jesus is in control. And you're going to see right away, and it's going to give you comfort, it should give you comfort, that the demons are begging Jesus not to obliterate them by sending them into the abyss. The abyss is the eternal destination for the damned. But they're begging him. How many of you beg people when you're in control? You don't beg people when you're in control. If my kids are in their bedroom, this is when they're younger. They're all gone now. And they're sitting there playing peacefully. We're good. But when they jump on the bed and they see me coming, begging begins immediately. You don't beg when you're in control. You beg... If you're being controlled. These demons were being controlled. It ought, that ought to give you comfort from the very get-go. It's kind of like a prisoner of war who begs his captors for leniency. It's kind of like a criminal who begs the judge to reduce his sentence. And what they're doing is they're begging Jesus to go easy on them. To send them into a herd of swine. I heard of pigs. And Jesus obliges. And what happens? When the demons came out of the man, they were sent into the swine, they were sent into the pigs. And look at the 33rd verse. The herd then rushed down the steep bank into the lake. And what happened to them? They drowned. They went down and they met their watery grave. Now, when you're reading this text, Certain things ought to pop out, ought to hit you. Put the two words, watery grave, in the back of your mind because we're going to refer to this and wrap this whole sermon up here in about 15, 20 minutes. Okay? Or however long it takes. I think a lot of people who read this text from Luke the 8th chapter read it and say, okay, we're done. Great story, let's move on to the next. But the story's not over. The best part of the story's coming. Go back to the poor demonic man. Where is he? What's he doing? Answer, he was freed. We're told in the 35th verse, 835, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. Here again, a great verse. Pause. Study this. You know what this means? Sitting at the feet of Jesus is a posture of a disciple. In Jewish culture, to sit at someone's feet was to become a disciple of the rabbi. 
This man is ready to stick with Jesus. In fact, he begged that he might be with him. He begged that he might learn underneath him. What does Jesus say? Look at the 39th verse. Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. In other words, Jesus says, share your story. Give your testimony. You see, the man wants to be a student, but Jesus calls him to be what? A storyteller. Not a student, a storyteller. You know what this says to me? Everybody's got their gig. Everybody's got their job. This man's job was to go back and testify. Tell people what Jesus had done. And Jesus tells the guy to go back and to show people, tell people your previous way of life. Tell them the story and what hell you went through. You went through hell. And tell them the one named Jesus who delivered you from the destroyer. And so a great story from the book of Luke. And the the narrative is epic. It's a story of warfare. You know, the Bible speaks oftentimes of warfare. Paul speaks of warfare. Paul speaks of warfare physically, but especially Paul speaks of warfare spiritually. And Paul says, you struggle with something. And really, he says, your struggle is not with flesh and blood. But he says in Ephesians 6, 12, your struggle is against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Here again in the text, you got to pause. You say, there's, there's evil forces in the heavenly places? Really? We're not talking here about heaven where God sits and reigns and is in control. We're not talking here about where Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. We're not talking about the throne of God here. There's a great Greek word here, eparanus. And it talks about that, that there's a sphere. And the sphere is angelic and the sphere is also demonic and it's almost like these evil and elect angels are warring they're warring in our midst we're also told in the book of John that the devil's job is to kill the devil's job is to destroy but I especially love Revelation the ninth chapter John calls him the angel of the bottomless pit that's the abyss and the Apollyon, which is translated the destroyer. He's the destroyer. And so this morning we make no mistake that Satan sends his minions or he sends his followers with one goal in mind and one goal only. To destroy you. And we need to talk about that at times. I mean, it's sad where you ask somebody, do you believe in the devil? And they say, no. As if to say that you're confessing him as your savior. No, yeah, we believe in the devil. Not as our savior, but we believe in the devil as demonic. As the one whose job it is, whose whose obligation with himself it is to do one thing, and that's to destroy you and tear you away from the faith. Think about what they did, the demons did, to destroy this man. They took away his dignity. He's naked, and he's living amongst the dead in the tombs with the skeletons. They took away his relationships, ostracized him from the community in which he lived. He's living alone. All right, let's put this into our vernacular a little bit. Let's change gears a little bit and make this very, very applicable. I don't want anybody here leaving today that doesn't get this. Even today. We see Satan's destructive forces at play in the lives of people and our own lives. What does Satan do? He destroys marriages. He destroys relationships. He destroys livelihoods. He destroys the lives of the unborn. Satan loves to come into a church and destroy a church. Satan loves nothing more to see confrontation and dissension to split a church. Satan loves nothing more than for pastors to preach irreverence, for pastors to preach against true biblical doctrine and theology. Satan loves when pastors do that, and and unfortunately that's happening abundantly even in our own community. 
Satan loves destroying the mental health of individuals. And it's one assault after another. The question I get more than most in especially 7th and 8th grade class is, are there still demons today roaming around, lurking and waiting to destroy us? If you're asking, are there people who suffer from demon possession like this man? The answer, I believe, is yes. Yes. And yet, at the same time, I believe that demons, while they may not possess the soul of an individual as visibly, I say as visibly as we see here in Luke the 8th chapter, all right, now let me pause here a little bit and say that if you're a Christian, all right, now hear this, kids, kids hear this, if you're a Christian and you possess Jesus Christ as your Savior, he will not possess your soul. You're not going to walk around deranged. You're not going to be possessed by Satan. At the same time, he does cause people significant distress. And he causes people, we've seen it, to do destructive things. I think about people who are in the grip of drugs and alcohol addiction. I think about the people who are caught up in destructive lust of the flesh and who are affecting people around them and, and, and themselves. And whether it's because of chemical or psychological problems, there can be little doubt that we are living underneath the remnant. Go back to the Genesis story of Adam and Eve, the original sin. We are living up underneath the remnant of a fallen world that Satan abuses. And truth be told, we are fighting demons every day. And unfortunately, some people more than others. And you can see the destruction that, that Satan does in the lives of people. So when we find ourselves here, what do we do? What's the remedy? Well, it's something that you hear every week in this church. And it is the main reason why we proclaim preach and teach this every week in this church. What do we do? We cling to the gospel. And the gospel proclaims simply this, 1 John 3, 8, Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. That's why he came. And so while Satan bombards himself on you, causes you to think things that aren't true, Claims to be the destroyer, the gospel proclaims victory over Satan. The victory's won. Look at the message on the cross that we have for you. The destroyer, that's what this is all about, the message. The destroyer has been disarmed by the cross and will one day be destroyed. Look at Colossians 2.15. Jesus has disarmed the powers of evil, making a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. And so we cling to Jesus, knowing that by his death and by his resurrection, he has destroyed Satan's power. And he will deliver you from the destruction that the devil desires to afflict upon you. I don't know everybody's heart, mind, and soul here. I don't know who truly is a believer. I'm looking right now at what we're told is the visible church. We know that God really deals with the invisible church. What's in your heart? There may be people here today that are afflicted with some horrible, horrible things. And no one could ever imagine what you're going through. I'm going to ask you to do two things today. This not only involves people who are afflicted, but everybody. There are two things, two places where we turn. Number one, turn to your baptism. In years past, I found this was interesting. Very interesting. Matter of fact, I wouldn't mind saying this, but I don't think people would like it. But anyway. In years past, baptism was seen as an exorcism. Isn't that what it is? Yeah, that's what it is. Baptism was seen as an exorcism. In it, the baptizer, the clergy, the one baptizing, says these words. Depart, you unclean spirit, 
exorcism, okay, depart you with unclean spirit and make room for the Holy Spirit in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Oh, by the way, let me tell you the most important part of this text. I hope you've caught it. Remember I told you to put something in the back of your head and bring it out? Bring it back out. Speaking of baptism, notice what happens to the herd of swine. All right? The demons are cast into the swine, and they rush down the embankment and are drowned. Isn't this what baptism signifies? Sin is drowned. You see, that's why you have to take these texts and take your time. Don't just roll through it. Pause. Study it. Do a word study. Do a parallel passage study. Do a media context study. Get into the vernacular. Look at the history. This text implies the drowning of sin in baptism. The means of grace. What is the visible mark of baptism? Water, cleansing, reaffirmation, your born again experience, the drowning of sin. Martin Luther says this about baptism. It indicates that the old Adam in us should by daily contrition and repentance. By the way, did you know that the Bible says you are to repent of your sin? I think there's a lot of people who just go on life and just blow that off. No, repentance is necessary. Contrition, that's sorrow for your sin. And repentance, you acknowledge you're sinful and you run to the gospel. Be drowned and die with all sins and evil desires. And so when we face our demons, we declare over them, number one, I am baptized. My sin has been drowned. Get behind me, Satan. And you, through the power of Jesus Christ, have no power over me. And that leads me to number two. What do we turn? The Word of God. I have written underneath here somewhere. I've got a lot of things buried in here and written underneath here. Hebrews 4.12. This is living and active. This is God's breath in human print, as I have explained here to this congregation for a long time. We go to the clear, inerrant, inspired Word of God. We proclaim, not only to ourselves as a reaffirmation, but we proclaim to those around us, Jesus' victory is in the cross. It is about the forgiveness of sins. He won it. It is the power of God over the attacks of Satan. 1 John 4, 4. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. I want you to read that verse with me. Let's read it together. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And then, recognizing our baptism, connected to the word, remembering what Jesus Christ has done, Fellowshipping in, the, fellowshipping in the altar, in the true body and blood of Jesus Christ, having koinonia and fellowship with our church body, then we are healthy, mature Christians who go out into a world like Jesus told the man who was once demonic, and we proclaim that message to people who desperately need to hear it. And we simply tell our story. We testify. We give a testimony like the man who was demon-possessed. He says, return to your home and tell people what I have done. Tell people the hell you've been through, but tell people that I destroyed Satan. Tell your story, he says, and tell it well. Luke chapter 8, an epic story about a Savior who goes to bat, who destroys Satan, and your sins are washed clean. Right? To God alone be all the glory. Oh, one more thing. Let me end with this. I've had an opportunity to tell several people this this week. This is what I want you to walk out of here with. You possess, this is powerful, you possess a strength in Jesus Christ that the devil does not have. 
You possess a strength that the devil does not have. To God be all the glory. Amen. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and keep your minds in Christ Jesus unto eternal life. Amen. Let's rise for prayer. And all of you is more than enough for all of me for every thirst and every need you satisfy me with your love and all I have in you is more than
Let's all rise, please. Of your presence, we, your temple, give you reverence. Come and rise to your rest and be blessed by our praise as we stay when you move I'll move I will follow all your ways are good all your ways are sure I will trust in you alone higher than my sight high above my life I will trust in you alone. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow you. Who you love, I'll love. How you serve, I'll serve. If this life I lose, I will follow you. Yeah, I will follow you. Light unto the world, light unto my life. I will live for you alone. You're the one I seek, knowing I will find all I need in you alone. In you alone. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow you. Love, I'll love how you serve I'll serve if this life I lose I will follow you yeah I will follow you yeah in you there's life everlasting in you there's freedom for my soul in you there's joy unending joy I will follow where you go I'll go where you stay I'll stay when you move I'll move I will follow you who you love I'll love how you serve I'll serve if this life I lose I will follow where you go I'll go where you stay I'll stay when you move I'll move I will follow you who you love I'll love how you serve, I'll serve. If this life I lose, I will follow you. Yeah, I will follow you. Yeah, I will follow you. Yeah, I will follow you. Yeah. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Have a great week.